that made me a little tired. <laughs> well, I'm happy to be here. And uh, Bonnie and I have been good friends for several years. And I see a couple of other faces that have been good friends with me for a number of years. And, um, and I'm happy to be here this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about unity and oneness. And uh, the word unity, a lot of us you know, that are in academics sometimes or have worked for the military, as I have in the past, think of acronyms all the time. And unity, I, I thought about what is the acronym for unity? And uh, the, the, the thought that came to me from probably spirit, because lots of thoughts come and we don't know exactly, wow, where did this thought come from? Is you and I together? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my acronym for unity. So we'll look at what I'm going to try to present to you today. As uh, Bonnie said, I'm a member of the, of the uh, Baha'i faith. And some of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with the Baha'i faith. Many of you know our friend Gordon Butler, who's probably played the violin in this area a number of times. Um, he's a member of our Baha'i faith and sits on our uh, local spiritual assembly now. But unity and oneness. And in the Baha'i faith, this is uh, all about unity and oneness. And so we have a great connection here. Um, our Baha'i faith starts basically with a precursor called the Bab, before Baha'u'llah. The Bab uh, meaning it's Arabic for just the gate, kind of like John the Baptist was for, for Jesus, the gate. And Baha'u'llah. Uh, the gate opened in 1844. This was an interesting year to me because in reading literature, many of you have probably seen the movie or read the book, The Three Musketeers. And uh, it was what Alexander Dumas that wrote, The Three Musketeers in 1844. <laughs> and he said, all for one and one for all. And so that to me was very appropriate <laughs> that in 1844 when the Bab introduces the, the origins of the Baha'i faith, we have Alexander Dumas on the other side over there saying, all for one and one for all. And that is oneness, the whole, one and the whole. I'm sorry, can we go back just one more time because I think I, Baha'u'llah is the initial founder of the Baha'i faith. And um, it's an Arabic word, which means Baha, glory, and Allah of God. So it's the glory of God. And it was the name that he took when he uh, began his teachings. So a believer in the teachings of Baha'u'llah is a Baha'i. OK, thank you. Now, like many messengers of, of the spirit, uh, they have suffered. And likewise, Baha'u'llah also spent 40 years of his life either in exile or imprisoned. And amazingly, during that time, though, he was able to reveal over 100 books and major tablets that defined the laws and all the teachings of the Baha'i faith. Um, OK. He had uh, a number of children, but Abdul Baha was the, the, the son that he uh, spent most of his time in exile with him uh, since he was about seven years old. So he spent the next uh, 40 years with, in exile or in prisons, uh, uh, ending up in Accra, Israel, which is Israel now, but it was Palestine at the time, in a prison there. Um, when Baha'u'llah passed, and before he passed, rather, he wrote a will. And in the will and testament, he appointed Abdul Baha to be the interpreter of the Baha'i faith writings so that there would be no uh, room for divisiveness. Because we all said, well, what does that mean? We would say, Abdul Baha, what does that mean? And then he would say what it meant. And of course, our spirit is to maintain unity and oneness. And so we would say, well, he should know. He spent 40 years with his father. And so we don't, we don't uh, sit there and argue about it. We just proceed forward. Um, his name, of course, Abdul Baha, means servant of glory. So he was actually serving the, the principles that his father uh, was teaching. So the foundational principle of the Baha'i faith is unity, you and I together. Yeah, right? So this is how we do things. It's very difficult for us to do it all alone. 
None of us have really gone through life alone. Uh, we can all point to people, many people, that made us whole, that helped us to get to the next level in our lives. So unity is a very powerful word. Oneness is even more powerful. So in the Baha'i faith, we believe in oneness, one God, one religion, one world, one human family. There are no boundaries anywhere except the ones that we have established. There are no walls anywhere on this planet except the ones we have built. Uh, I've been to the Great Wall, and it was a great wall. <laughs> a lot of people suffered <laughs> building that wall. And it was a wall to kind of represent divisiveness because it was to keep people out and to keep other people safe, so allegedly in our minds, right? We build walls because we think we're fearful. So we build walls to either keep things in or keep things out and people primarily. So I'm a very anti-wall person, <laughs> but we have walls all over here in Las Cruces, don't we? We have a lot of rock walls. And they're okay because they do keep our pets, you know, confined and things like that. <laughs> okay. So one God said, the universe and all creatures and forces within it have been created by one divine being. And, uh, and that is the oneness of God, that we're all created by some great spirit somewhere that created universe and universes and planets, uh, not just ours. Of course, we keep discovering new planets every day almost anymore. So one of my favorite quotes is this one here, how wondrous is the unity of the living, a unity which is exalted above all limitations. So limitations that transcendeth the comprehension of all created things. And we're still in that journey of, cre of understanding. And so I think that's what keeps us a little bit divided. We don't understand enough about each other. Um, so if we have the oneness of God, then we have the oneness of what we, the Baha'is believe is the oneness of manifestations, messengers of God that have come through the centuries and that he has revealed, spirit has revealed itself through humanity through a series of these divine messengers, we say, including Abraham, Moses, Krishna, Zoroaster, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, and now Baha'u'llah, or the Baha'is, whose teachings guide and educate us. So these messengers have provided the material advancements and the spiritual evolution of humanity. So we look at, uh, Baha'u'llah kind of uh, uh, analyzes it to, uh, compares it to school, public schools. He says, you know, in the first grade, we go in at about five or six or seven, and our minds are not yet quite developed. The teacher might know physics, but they don't teach us physics in the first grade. Uh, they teach us simple little principles that we might understand at that point. And so humanity has been this way. We've been sending messengers, and with each new messenger comes a higher level of learning of how to live together and become one in this world. And so we graduate. And during the time Baha'u'llah was alive, he said, we're, we're kind of in the teeny bopper years right now. And so we're still kind of trying to get into adulthood and mature a little bit more, and one of these days we'll be as wise as the elders. Um, okay. So we have the oneness of religion. So we believe that these teachings, the teachings of each of these uh, manifestations, uh, in essence, are successive chapters of one progressive religion. Um, that they establish principles and laws, and they become systemized into our system. I teach sometimes law also, and I start with the origin of law. Where did law come from? And of course, many laws came from religious beliefs. We have the tablets, you know, and Moses' tablets, thou shalt not kill. Well, we have codes now everywhere, statutes. Thou shalt not kill. It's called murder, involuntary manslaughter. We have those laws now. They become statu statutes. They become actual real laws on written paper. And so these laws come into our lives to try to help us be nicer to each other and try to prevent us from being so evil sometimes, but, but we, I think all of us that are in this room probably 
will agree that it's spirit, the spirit of a person that really helps us to make those kinds of good decisions or go this way. Oops, sorry. Oops. Sorry. Voila. Um, okay. And then we have probably one thing that we can all, you know, be extremely, uh, can relate to because we're all family. We're all human beings. And I think this is one of the biggest struggles we have in the world is uh, treating ourselves that way. Sometimes I hear my friends say, well, I don't want to go there to that function because I don't know anybody there. And when you have a different way of looking at the world as a world citizen or as a family, one family, you don't think that way because you go there knowing you're going to meet your family. And so it's always a wonderful opportunity to go anywhere and meet new relatives. <laughs> you, know, you could call them cousins or whatever you want to call them, but we really are one family. And when we start shifting our thoughts that way, as kind of Bonnie was talking about, I think, in the last presentation, is there has to be a shift of how we look at the world, kind of a transformation of our minds, of how we start to relate to each other. And it's really a nice way to look at the world because you're a lot less fearful when you're traveling. You can travel all by yourself and, and you don't worry. There's always someone uh, there that's going to be uh, of help to you. Like Bonnie says, I have lots and lots of stories about that I could share. One of them I remember was when I first uh, went to England to, to meet my husband. I actually met him in Albuquerque because he has friends uh, that were stationed there years ago at an Air Force base, and his friends happened to be uh, from the islands, Trinidad, who played cricket. So my husband played cricket. So Sonny, who is of Hindu-Indian uh, background, was a cricket player. They became best friends. And so when, when Sonny came and uh, married Monica, from, a Mexican girl from Alamogordo, they retired in Albuquerque. And this was a passage for my husband to come and visit New Mexico, which who he fell in love with at that time. 1984, was it? Yes. And uh, so they became very, very good friends. And then I happened to meet him in Albuquerque on one of his visits from England. He would come almost every three or four or five years and spend an entire month with his friends here. And I just happened to meet him like two days before he was going back. And he invited me to go back. And of course, I didn't hesitate. He's a cutie. <laughs> and he tells the story. He tells the story about how I emailed him because he said, anytime you want to come to England, and people should never tell that to a world citizen that loves to travel, I will host you. I'll kindly host you. I said, OK. So by the time he got home, he tells his friends over there, there was an email from me <laughs> saying, I'm thinking about coming to England in September. But before he could even respond, he saw another email from me saying, how's the week of September the you know, 13th through the 23rd? I can be there. I booked the, I booked the flight. <laughs> he was so kind. And he said, OK. <laughs> Not telling me that that was actually the week that his friends go on a once a year annual championship playoff of cricket in London. And uh, he didn't say anything. So when I got there, he said, well, you know, a bunch of my friends and I will be taking the train from his uh, little Suffolk County little uh, village of about five, 6,000 people. They take the train up to London to this playoff. He says, I would, wanted to get a ticket for you, but they're all sold out. I said, that's OK. I, I just go and I'll spend the day in London by myself. And he says, oh my goodness, all by yourself? And I said, well, I can speak a little English, and, <laughs> and I, just got it, I just got in from China and Korea, <laughs> I could, and I couldn't speak a bit of Chinese, and somehow I survived. So I think I can survive a, a day in London. So when we look at the world as one family, this oneness, you, it does really take away a lot of your fears about human, the human family. So this oneness of humanity, 
Another one of my favorite quotes here is, the tabernacle of unity hath been raised. Right, like a flag. We are one, oneness. Regard ye not one another as strangers. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. So we're all kind of related. We all come from the same stock, right? And this is what turned me into a world citizen. The earth is but one country and mankind is citizens. And I'm an immigration lawyer. And so I believe very much in people should live wherever they want to live, like birds fly all over the place and coyotes come over from Mexico and they go over there. And, uh, you know, we should be able to do that without having to suffer so much. And then as a result of all these oneness, we are one world eventually. So we say regard the world as the human body. And when I was thinking of that, I thought of our world, our continent, and I thought, yeah, imagine if we were to cut off one arm, which is kind of what we do sometimes in politics and government. We exclude people just because. So I would say, well, yeah, let's see. This could be, this could be Europe, and this could be Asia, and this could be the Middle East, and my torso could be Africa, and my left leg is uh, South America, and my north leg my uh, other lake is North America. And I go, imagine, it is like one body. We are one body. And when we suffer, if I cut my head off, I wouldn't be able to do anything in the world. This is the Middle East. This is where we got calculus and lots of architecture. My husband and I were just in India, and we saw some of the be most beautiful architecture there. And so we thought, wow. Imagine having a little bit of Spanish in me. And of course, the, the Moors lived in Spain for 70, 700, 600, 500 years. And I always tell my, my Spanish-speaking friends, most of us are speaking Arabic, but we don't even know it. Pantalon. What's a pantalon? Your pantalones, pants, right? That's strictly an Arabic word. Camisa, shirt. Camis is the Arabic word. We just added a little A, camisa. So alberca is like swimming pool in Spanish. It's totally Arabic. So there's a lot of Arabic words that we're speaking. So it's important for us then to see ourselves as one body, as one world, one human family. Um, OK, you can go to the next one. So the principal teachings of the Baha'i faith is that religion, or spiritual upbringing, must be the cause of unity. Baha'u'llah said that if religion was going to be a divisive thing, it was best not to have a religion at all. Just don't have a religion. So really, religion is for the purpose of bringing people together in joyful unification and, and do what is good for all. And sometimes that takes a little bit of sacrifice. And it also takes a little bit of transformation. We have to deal with selfishness. Oh, we have to deal with that instinct of survivor, survival, you know? Who gets to drink the last drop of water here? It's, it's difficult. I tell my students it was easy to become a Baha'i and declare myself, but to be one is very difficult. It's challenging, but it's kind of fun because I like challenges. I like challenges. The independent investigation of truth, the full equality of opportunity between women and men, the abol abolition of all forms of prejudice, the universal peace upheld by an internal tribunal. We get a little bit political in the Baha'i faith, but it's a spiritual tribunal, not a political tribunal. Universal education, another principle, a universal auxiliary, auxiliary language, and that religion must be harmonious with science. As a child growing up, I was kind of not, I was kind of discouraged to study things that maybe weren't too, religi uh, too religious, but, and, the, and discouraged things that were too scientific because they kind of contradicted some of the things that I was being taught in the church that I grew up in. And that 
the economic problems of today can be solved with spiritual solutions, when people really come and look at each other as we love each other first. So we love each other. If I love my child and I need to buy some food and it's going to take economic, you know, economics of some sort, how do I resolve that problem? Uh, and when there's love, it's a lot easier to want to solve the problem, uh, but sometimes it's very challenging, very challenging, because there's a lot of conflicts, uh, conflicting things coming up. So, okay. So religion must be the cause of unity. The purpose of religion is revealed from the heaven of God's holy will is to establish unity and concord. Okay. This is one of my favorite ones, and I teach this even with my business law class over there. I always tell my students, investigation of the truth. Just because I said it, just because the book says it, maybe you should make sure you investigate for yourself. And, and many of us, I think, you know, we know what we know, and we believed only what we knew, because that's all we knew. But when we investigated further, coming to New Mexico State University as a student, and I was telling Bonnie and Larry yesterday, you know, when I was growing up um, in this little Protestant church, I was told, don't even look at Catholics. You're committing a sin. So when I came to NMSU and I was surrounded by Catholics, you can imagine how I felt. And I couldn't dance, and I couldn't, you know, cut my hair, and I couldn't put a little color on my lips, and a little color on my nails. I couldn't wear pantalones. It was not ladylike. Today I thought I would be ladylike, and I wore a skirt. <laughs> Mostly I wear pantalones. It was very difficult. But I started doing a little bit of investigation of my own, and I met people that were Hindus and uh, Muslims and Quechuas from South America, and I love languages. And I said, well, they're not so bad. And I didn't get struck by lightning and nothing terrible happened to me. And in fact, I liked them a lot. And they liked me, and we became friends. And so this is a very important principle of the Baha'i faith that we teach children, the independent investigation of truth. Um, full equality of opportunity between uh, women and men. These uh, World Congress uh, of Women that I, uh, Congress, uh, World, World, World Women's Congresses that I attend every three years in different parts of the world, it's about justice and social justice. However, it's always about equality because without equality, we don't feel that justice is done. If we're not treated a little bit more equal in opportunities or when laws are in place, we don't feel like justice was done. And this is why I like um, equality. Thank you. This is why I like equality because when there is equality, we're going to see a little more justice. And when we have justice, we come together a little bit more. We have unity. And when we have unity, we have peace. There's no reason for us to be fighting and arguing. We're at peace. And so these are the four little topics that I teach a lot in, uh, that I share a lot in, uh, in our workshops. So equality has, was described by uh, Baha'u'llah or Abdul Baha, his son, as a bird. One wing, and I'm just kind of summarizing here, one wing was woman, one wing is man, male. And if one is weaker than the other, then the bird of humanity can never fly. It can never reach its potential, its greatest potential. When we described it that way in a, in a the Women's World Congress in, in Ottawa, Canada, it really made an impact. And people started drawing these birds with really strong wings. Not like this. We just can't fly when we have a wing that's weaker than the other one. So it makes a lot of sense that we have to have a very strong bird to, to be able to reach. Okay. And prejudice. We teach our children that there's absolutely no room for prejudice. Prejudging. The minute somebody comes in through the door, there's this tendency and as a, as a defense lawyer in, the, in criminal matters in federal court, I would have to dress my defendant clients in a certain way because I knew that the minute they walked into the courtroom, the 12 members of the jury would be judging them. 
I mean, it was really interesting in one court when the, when the witness identified the lawyer as the potential criminal because of the way he was dressed compared to his client who was dressed in a very nice suit. They just assumed that the lawyer had to be, the witness apparently had not seen the, the uh, defendant very clearly and judged him more on how he was dressed than on what he looked like. So that was perception. So we, we tell our children, we encourage our children actually to mingle with all kinds of children from different backgrounds, different races, different religions, bring them home. And my son was raised that way. His first five years were in Germany. And in Germany, he had a German babysitter, a Japanese babysitter, an African-American babysitter, and a babysitter from Spain. So he is about a year and a half old, and we're at the commissary and in the grocery ba basket. And I parked my basket near the ramen noodles, which I'd never eaten. And he starts throwing these ramen noodles into the bag because his Japanese babysitter would feed him ramen noodles. He's now 43, that's 40 years later, or so, 42 years later, and he still has his little pearl ingrained chopsticks that his babysitter gave him in Germany. And he, and he knew how to use them. So when I took him to China at the age of 13, he was very good with the rice. <laughs> very good. And he's taught his three children how to use chopsticks, so they don't hesitate to do that. We created you all from the same dust. So we're all the same, basically. And we go back the same, basically, right? So no one should exalt himself over the other. Since we have created you all from the same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, from your deeds and actions, and that's the key, our deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. So actions are, are really the key, how we, and our deeds. Who do we eat with, you know? Do we ever mingle with other people? Do we invite? I love having international parties, that's where I, also met my friend uh, Diana also at a uh, interfaith council meeting, and then uh, invited her, Diana Johnson from Chicago. That's a foreign country. <laughs> okay. And then universal uh, peace, upheld by an international tribunal. A lot of folks get a little bit scared. What are you talking about? You're talking about one dictator or somebody you know, is telling us what to do everywhere? Well, the Baha'is actually have that already. We call it the Universal House of Justice. And it sits on Mount Carmel in Haifa, Israel. And it's very interesting because the first time I ever, I ended up there, I had actually met a mem two, of the, two or three of the members of the Universal House of Justice out here when they were not yet members of the Universal House of Justice. And uh, one of them happened to be in Albuquerque. He was passing through, and a friend from here said, let's go meet up with this member of the Universal House of Justice. He was an African-American man, and he had been a lawyer and a judge in Maryland, and he was a very active Baha'i. Eventually got elected to the Universal House of Justice, and I happened to go a couple of years later, and uh, I was there for a three-day visit. And in the visitation center, we all get together for lunch, and we all share lunch and stuff, and. It was lunchtime, and someone said, hey, I've seen a note on, on the bulletin board out there in the hallway for you the last two days. You haven't picked it up. I said, why would anybody give me a note? Nobody knows where I am. So anyway, I go pick up the note, and there's this note, and it says, hello, Beatrice. I understand you're visiting. If you have a chance, please, if you have a break, please call me. Come and, come and say hello. And it was this Universal Member House of Justice. And I go, Wow, how did he know I was here? And it was, he was very humble, very humble. They're all very humble, all nine of them. Every day they go together as a group and they go and pray and they meditate for a long time about decisions they have to make that day. And so these nine members meet with spirit every morning, like here when we open this session this morning, and they get guidance on how to make the best decisions for all of us. 
So we have a question we write, we email, it's directly to them, and we talk about economic problems in the world. We talk about educational issues in Africa. We need a school over here. We have the International Educational Center there also. Um, so it's not about a political government tribunal, but rather a spiritual guidance of some sort that guides all of us as human beings in the world. Okay. You're going to give me a, a, a signal? And universal education. This is really very close to my heart as an educator, and because as a child, I was a strictly Spanish-speaking child. Since I entered school, my teachers didn't speak Spanish. And in the place that I started in the panhandle in those days, you got spanked a lot if you disobeyed a teacher. And when the teacher said in English, go left, and you went right, you disobeyed. So I would come home and go, oh, I got spanked again, you know. <laughs> And my father was very wise, actually. He would say, it's not your fault. It's that poor teacher. She's not very competent if she can't communicate with her students. He'd say, ah, they didn't train her very well because a good teacher would be able to communicate with her students in some way, get some help. To, you know. So it's not your fault. So one of these days, you'll be all right. You'll, you'll live through it. You know? He was always, you'll live through it. And I did. I did have to stay in the first grade twice, <laughs> but I lived through it. And once I learned the English and started learn, uh, reading books and fell in love with education, it was wonderful. Every one of our minds, and my father used to say that, cada cabeza es un mundo. Every head is a world of its own. Try to understand it. Don't judge. Rich in gems of in, inestimable value. Education can alone cause it to reveal its treasures and enable mankind to benefit. So the more we know, the easier I think life gets for us. Sometimes it's a little scary, but it, it gets better. And then the other principle was having this language. Baha'u'llah did not want us to suppress languages. Just said, have a language. This will create a oneness. It was interesting because we when we were in India, one of the our Indian friends there said, one of the good things the British the British did when they came over here and colonized us was to teach us English, because we had so many different languages. We were always arguing, and there was such divisiveness here. So English united our people and cricket. So, and of course now India beats England in cricket, doesn't it? It's. It's good to maintain our cultures and our languages. They're beautiful languages. They're like art. But then we also need some unity. And a, a unifying language is good in economics and education and in uh, governmental decisions everywhere we go. We need to be able to communicate. There have been disasters because people misinterpreted things, <laughs> even people dying because they thought they were saying a mule when they were saying a horse and someone had stolen the horse, not the mule. Okay. okay. Religion must be harmonious with science. So we believe science and, and religion go hand in hand. They are one, really. Um, science without the moral grounding of religion or spirit is materialism. And spirit or religion without the rational support of science becomes superstition. And so, again, educating ourselves and this becoming one. The more we know, biologically speaking, even physiologically speaking, we know we're one. We are one. Why are we arguing so much, right? And spiritual solutions for economic problems. Unity based on justice. If we become one and we're saying we're looking for justice here, like housing. I've been a housing and a foreclosure defense attorney here for about two and a half years. And when we talk about justice and the elderly having a good house to live in or a disabled person, when, whenever I mention the word, well, it, not, it wouldn't be very just to kick this child old person out of the house because she wasn't able to pay her rent today. Let's see what we can do. There's got to be other alternatives. 
it's an economic issue, and it becomes an economic solution based on spiritual, for me, based on spiritual principles of unity and oneness, because she is one of us. She's like my grandmother, you know? I don't want my grandmother on the street. Now, sometimes some of these grandmothers can be very mean to you. I've had little grandmothers kick me out of their house because uh, I suggested that, you know, we could uh, renovate their toilet. They had a little outhouse out there on Mesquite Street, and they said, we could get you an indoor toilet. Get out of my house. I like my outhouse. So then I would come back about a month later to my little grandmother, and my grandmother would say, my adopted grandmother would say, where have you been? I haven't seen you in a month. But I love these little ladies. <laughs> and so with this kind of love, I forgave them within the month, and I said, I think she's probably forgotten that she kicked me out. So economic solutions come with spiritual love, can be very successful. It's a challenge. Again, if we keep remembering that we have the spiritual oneness in us, then it becomes a little bit more easier because we can justify it. If this was my grandmother, what would I do? The last thing we have here is really just a um, kind of an example of how all many of the major religions of the world have the same rule, the same golden rule. As a child, I grew up thinking there was only one golden rule. But the more I studied, the more I learned that almost every major religion in the world had a golden rule. That we really should not do to others what we don't want done to ourselves. Um, what is hateful, do not to your fellow men. Do not do that to your fellow men. Um, no one is a believer until he desires for his brother what he desires for himself or his sister. And um, wish not for others what you wish not for yourselves. So it's really about, I think Bonnie mentioned this too, is putting ourselves into that, into that person and becoming one. And just asking the question, how would I feel? We still have that uh, racial problems in the United States. It's really sad for me because color's beautiful. I mean, look at this temple here. I mean, uh, your, your, your center of spiritual living. It is beautifully bright orange. My friend wearing purple, another friend wearing turquoise, another one green, red, pink. I mean, it's beautiful. Colors are beautiful. So I hope that with more education, and I appreciate all the workshops that are being held here in the Center for Spiritual Living because it does bring people closer together when, they edu when they're educated in this principle of oneness, one in the whole. We are one. So my challenge to humanity is always uh, start living it, start doing it. There's one little uh, Baha'i quote that I like, is to be kind to every being that crosses your path. So what is kindness? It can be as simple as a smile, as simple as a smile. So one of the actions we can take is to become aware of how we are, and especially our eyes, because our eyes that's what immediately communicates with another person. That's our initial communication always. So I play this game when I board airplanes. And it's really interesting because my undergraduate was in sociology, you know, the study of group behavior, right? And so I'm walking down the aisle and I'm looking at every person that's sitting. And I'm smiling with my eyes. And some of them go like, have a question mark on their face. Like, why is she smiling at me? Others smile. Others look away into their newspaper right away. But it's really interesting. Many people do smile back. They do smile back. And there's a connection. We connect. So I want to thank all of you here. And I may be you know, speaking to the choir again that sings already this uh, whole song of oneness. But thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, take that into action. Thank you.